All right, everybody, we are here. We're on our very last episode of this series, How We're Good All Story of Music. We've been doing this now for, let's see, how many episodes? They do six episodes, so this is week number 12 of us doing this. Wow, I didn't realize it was that long. Beethoven here and I are glad if you guys have stuck around this far and have watched all of these episodes with us. And like I said, even though they don't get a ton of views, that's not really the point of this. The point is just to learn more about music and have fun. And it's always a lot more fun learning it with everyone everybody else. So our last episode left off kind of around the mid 20th century. We kind of got into a lot of stuff in the 30s and 40s. We haven't really gone beyond that. So I'll be interested to know if he gets into like rock and roll and some of the more modern stuff in recent decades. Oh, you guys also have to let me know down in the comments, what should we do next time for Music Sundays? Because now that we're done with this, we can move on to something completely new. A lot of you have suggested Howard Goddard's other series that he did. You know, he did one on the Beatles and I think one on like the big bangs of music. We can do that, but if you guys would like to to have a little break from Howard Goodall and do something a little different, just let me know. But I do want to get into comment time really quickly. I just want to bring up a few of your comments from last week's episode and we're going to go over them and have a nice little like review and discussion. <laughs> Our first comment comes from Andrew Clayton. He says, I would like to second the chap who recommended Waldemar, Jan News, Kat, uh, Zach. Janusak, a series on the Impressionists. They are excellent. He's also done the Baroque, the Renaissance, and several other related topics. They were entertaining and he has a wealth of knowledge to impart. So I guess we'll have to move into some art on this channel as well. After all, I feel like this channel is going to turn into like a Renaissance type channel where we just like study pretty much everything because that's kind of what I want to do. F Tumchk says, I don't know if it was inspired by Sadie's Parade, but the typewriter that was uh, done by Jerry Lewis that we saw last time um, is by an American composer, Leroy Anderson. He wrote lots of fun, popular pieces in that vein. I actually didn't have any idea that that was an actual song that was composed. Um, I guess it kind of sounds like it was, but yeah, for some reason I thought that Jerry Lewis had just kind of like that idea just to do the typewriter to the orchestra, but I guess not. Zaftra says the film Excalibur uses Orff's O Fortune, and in the UK it was constantly on a male colon advert called Old Spice. It's very, it's pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I did look it up, and it seems like it's just been in random movies and commercials and TV shows and stuff, so I'm sure that I've just heard it you know, in passing while watching stuff, and that's what I'm recognizing it from. Uh, we also have Old Spice over here too, so it's not just a UK thing. Is that the Excalibur film that has Patrick Stewart in it? Because if it is, I've probably seen it before, but it's been a really long time. Uh, Nosario Red says, when you say you recognize Rhapsody in Blue as an airline theme song, it was recognized, he recognized it from the Gremlins 2 when the female Gremlin reveals themselves. I haven't seen the Gremlins before, so I don't really know what you're talking about. But yeah, I did look up the Rhapsody in Blue airline thing, and and it was uh, like a big thing that United did and I think they still use it. Uh, I think another comment said that they still use it in their um, like in-flight instructions and stuff. I think that's correct because I did fly United probably two or three years ago and I feel like I remember that. Blaine Than says, thank you for continuing with the series even though the views haven't been as high as some. We appreciate it. Well, I do have a lot of interest in the comments and it seems like this subject is one that has some interest in it. So that's why I'm continuing with it. Also, it's just like my own personal interests. I just, you know, want to, to do this. So uh, yeah. Michael Millet or Malay says the Carmina Barana tune is in the UK associated with the British Airways commercial. Oh, okay. And Mac the Knife was more famously recorded by Bobby Darren. I probably have heard of Bobby Darren's uh, rendition before. I just associate it with Frank Sinatra for some reason. All right, well, that's it for your comments. Appreciate you guys leaving them. And as always, do the same on this video. But we're gonna go ahead and jump into part two, the very last part of this series. I don't really have anything else to say about it. I'm just kind of curious to see where it goes. In the USA, musical patriotism took a rather different form. I'll be marching to a love song while you're waiting for me. Each Once America entered the war at the end of 1941, a massive hearts and minds operation was put in place to educate and entertain both troops and public. 
And it wasn't just popular music that was pressed into service. One of America's leading composers, Aaron Copland, captured the public mood in his 1944 ballet, Appalachian Spring. I love Aaron Copland's music. Audiences adored Appalachian Spring with its touching innocence and optimism, embodied in its cleverly integrated 19th century shaker hymn tune, Simple Gifts. Appalachian Spring stirringly expects American victory in the war and the ushering in of a better age, reflected in the sincere and uncynical values of the pioneer rural communities it celebrates. Here it is danced by the choreographer who commissioned it, Martha Graham. It's kind of a creepy statue in the back though. Statues are real. Like Stravinsky's Firebird and The Rite of Spring, Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet or Ravel's Bolero, all riotously successful, Appalachian Spring was composed as a ballet score. Why is this significant? Because it's hard to imagine what 20th century classical music would have done without dance. It was as if the distraction of telling a story, reaching an audience or submitting to the structure of another art form liberated composers from the necessity to impress academics, musicologists, or worse still, each other with musical navel-gazing. Don't get me wrong, this sort of avant-garde music did find an audience. But in the 1950s, cutting-edge new music began to take a strange direction, going even further than the radicals of the 1920s with whole pieces being made up of found sounds and musical decisions being made by the toss of a coin or the mood of the musician. The high watermark of this movement has to be John Cage's creating in 1952 a piece called 4 minutes 33 seconds, consisting of the player or players doing nothing for that length of time, treated ever since by the classical music high command as a significant musical event. OK. The piece was in three movements. Here's an excerpt from the second. They're still doing anything. You know, they, these high art forms, like, I understand what... Is she gonna... No. While all this was going on... Like, I understand the point of it, you know, it's just artistic exploration and everything, but the practical, you know, the practicality of it is it's just, it's just kind of stupid, you know. I used to kind of be like that when I was younger and, you know, really, really like getting into the arts for the first time. I was kind of like that where I was like, let's just do something different and wild, you know, and all of that stuff. But as I've gotten older, I've got a different perspective on it now, and I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know. I just think it's kind of a, I mean, I guess human beings have to do that sort of thing to kind of keep the creative spark going. You don't want to get stuck into just the same old, same old, you know, and stuff like that, I guess, can spark, you know, new directions in music. So I guess that it serves some purpose, maybe, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you're just being different for the sake of being different at that point. Going on, it was the American musical, inspired in part by the lead shown by the Threepenny Opera, that began to comment on the social conditions of post-war America. Buying a credit is so nice. One look at us and they charge twice. Oh, yes, we're getting into musicals. I love musicals so much. It's my favorite kind of theater. Skyscraper's blooming. 
I've never seen West Side Story, though. I love well, musicals, but there are some that I haven't seen before. West Side Story, composed by the classically trained Leonard Bernstein, with lyrics by a young Stephen Sondheim, had instant impact, full as it was of great tunes, influenced by jazz and popular styles. Its audience, though, 50 years earlier, would most likely have been going to the opera instead. In the 50 years since West Side Story, the musical has gone from strength to strength, finding an audience of millions that Gilbert and Sullivan could only have dreamed of. The musical filled the vacuum that had been created by operas turning away from the accessible and popular style it had pursued since the 1630s. So can classical music ever regain its central position in people's emotions and affections? I think it already has, but it's done so in surprising ways. Just when it looked as if classical music might be sleepwalking to oblivion, along came a knight in shining, indeed silver armour the 20th century's own medium, cinema. Ah, uh, so it's, just, it's going to talk about film music. One of the first examples of a collaboration between a major classical composer and a filmmaker of genius was Prokofiev's groundbreaking score for Eisenstein's Alexander Nevsky from 1938. Although many classical composers had a go at writing for the cinema, for the most part it was specialist film composers who were prepared to subordinate their music to the requirements of the film. Even a comic strip gothic thriller like Batman, aimed at a mass audience, featured a full-on orchestral score classical in all but name, composed by the brilliantly quirky Danny Elfman, which made the action sequences thrilling and dark. If anyone tells you classical music is dead in the 21st century, all it means is that they don't go to the cinema. Mm -hmm. This was my point this whole time. While classical music in cinema thrived, popular music post-war wasn't standing still. Better microphones and recording techniques, the arrival of the long-playing record, and in particular a new breed of musical virtuoso were all laying the groundwork for the blossoming of electrifying new popular forms. One of them was the jazz style known as bebop, the frantic, somersaulting groove of the late 40s and 50s, where whole tracks were devoted to helter-skeltering instruments, sometimes solo, sometimes in coordinated groups, tumbling across notes at high speed, willfully oblivious of the harmonies they once belonged to. If death-defying off-piste skiing at high altitude down near vertical slopes had a musical equivalent, this would be it. I've heard of this music quite a bit, but I didn't know it was called Bebop, so it's my first time hearing that name. In the music of Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie, Bebop became the most influential form of jazz in the 50s and beyond. Whilst bebop relied for its forward momentum on giddy chaos, other forms of popular music wanted to go in the other direction, oh, towards a raucous, thumping Rock regularity. Rocket 88 was released in 1951. It's generally reckoned to be the first rock and roll record. Unlike the unpredictability of bebop, rock and roll's appeal lay in the clockwork rigidity of four beats to a bar. I didn't know this was the very first rock and roll song, though. Jazz was for cool dudes to listen to, rock and roll was for teenagers to dance and date to. And teenagers suddenly existed, apparently, after 1950. <laughs> <laughs> 
modern design, black convertible top, and the gals don't mind. Sporting with me right now. Not only did teenagers now exist, the affluent society that was America and eventually Europe in the post war period saw teenagers with pocket money to spend. Transistor radios and dance set record players meant that music aimed at teenagers was where the money was to be made, and the record business acted accordingly. Increasingly, albums were made for adults, singles in the hit parade were squarely aimed at youth. As time went by, other elements were added to the recipe of rhythm and blues. The simplicity and liveliness of country music and the soaring passion of gospel. I just have to say, it's really interesting that there was a switch that was flipped right around 1950 or so, where suddenly the youth culture kind of like came to the fore. It's just, uh, it's really interesting just how that happened so quickly. Keep me wrong. Come and love you, daddy, all right now, all right now. Hey, hey, all right. In the late 50s, the best pop songs were well-crafted packages still aimed at a teenage market, but often possessed of a sharp emotional intelligence. Tonight you're mine. Not only did popular songs become more sophisticated, in the 1960s it was popular music that became the voice of political opposition. It supported the civil rights movement. By the way, the 60s is my favorite era of music, I think. I just like the sound of it a lot. Um, I don't really think of it as in like political. I mean, obviously there were songs like this that were political, but for the most part it wasn't. So I understand that. And um, I prefer the songs that don't really get political, honestly. I just like to have fun listening to it and uh, don't have to think too much about it. But uh, yeah, 60s, my favorite, my favorite era. I kind of don't like that they just, I mean, I, I get his point that he's making. He wants to kind of show how music has, is evolving, you know, through the decades. So it's a fair point to make that music kind of got a little political during this era, but it was just like so much more than that. And I guess that's kind of like the critique of this whole series. It kind of just like hones in on one particular aspect of whatever composer or era, you know, and it kind of like doubles down on that and kind of ignores all of the other stuff. So that's why we have to go back and watch other videos to kind of fill in the gaps here. It was popular song that spoke out against the Vietnam War. And it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. Next up is Vietnam, and it's five, six, seven, open up the pearly gates. Well, ain't no time to wonder why. Sorry, I just had to go let Scarlett in, so she's in here right now. Hi. Oh, we're going to say hi. Say hi to everybody, Scarlett. Say hi. We're all listening to our music. She's been outside playing. She's wound up. All right. All right, Scarlett, we have to finish watching. No. <laughs> She's very sweet, but she has a lot of energy. Yes. Oh my gosh. I would be well gonna die. Come on, Wall Street. Pick it light and pick it side. Don't punish me with brutality. Okay. Get up. Talk to me so you can see oh, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on, yeah, what's going on. Knocked over a light. That America's conscience in the period of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War was pricked not by its leading classical composers, but by popular music, says something about the changing status of the two genres in the 1960s. 
The inescapable reality is that classical music had by this time lost its ability to voice the hopes and fears of the majority of the population, a status it had certainly enjoyed when the music of Verdi, for example, expressed the whole hopes of the Italian people for independence. It does it little credit to have let itself reach the precipice of redundancy. That's not to say that pop songs were anything like as musically complicated as the classical music they were fast outstripping in the public's affections. The sheer volume of songs composed, albums recorded and careers launched in the blossoming of the pop age shouldn't blind us to the fact that in purely musical terms, the melodies, harmonies and rhythms of the vast majority of those songs were both relatively limited and relatively static. Large swathes of the pop, rock and soul repertoire are variants on the basic blues template, with a straight four in a bar drum beat, a diet of between three and twelve chords, and a smallish smorgasbord of instruments to choose from, revolving around guitar, bass, keyboard and drums. One group who started out as a no-frills guitar and drums outfit not only became the most famous musicians on the planet, the Beatles revolutionised pop music. Ringo's my favourite. I've actually met him before too. The Beatles' music swiftly moved from catchy but simple rhythm and blues to a sophisticated musical mix that encompassed all the styles they'd grown up with as well as new ones they'd invented. From the beginning of their careers, they'd happily plundered musical influences from a plethora of earlier genres, like the Anglo-Celtic folk modes, or scales, in this song. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been. Lives in a dream, waits at the window, wearing the fake face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? Or the tongue in cheek novelty song style of music hall in songs like this. When I get older, losing my hair, many years from now, will you still be sending me a valentine? Birthday greetings, bottle of wine. The Beatles also introduced into progressive pop music such exotic innovations as an improvising classical orchestra, hand organs, 18th century piccolo trumpets. And recorders. No other group of musicians in history did as much to expand the possibilities of recording technology as did the Beatles at Abbey Road Studios. I've actually read a book. They, there's a book and I forgot what it was called. But they they wrote an entire no it was it was written by one of the engineers that worked with the Beatles, and he wrote an entire book, uh, kind of like detailing um, the different techniques that they came up with and you know how they kind of like put it all together, um, even like jerry rigging things with you know just random objects they had around the studio and stuff. It's a fascinating read. I don't remember what it was called. Um, if I can find it, I will put it on in the description of this video in case any of you guys are interested in it. But it was one of my favorite books to read about the Beagle, uh, Beagles, Beatles, actually. Sorry, I'm just checking on Scarlett. She was, I don't think you guys could see it because the, um, the video is in the way, but she was on my bed um, chasing her tail. <laughs> That's why I was laughing. Sorry, I really am paying attention, um, but I am very familiar with the Beatles music, so, you know, this, this isn't new to me. The message their irrepressible creativity sent out to the young at heart of the world, swimming in teenage pop culture, 
was that old stuff still had a role to play, that music's past was cool and interesting and fun too. They were the most unlikely saviours of old-fashioned music, but that's undoubtedly what they were. Let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born. Though she was born a long, long time ago, your mother should know. Ooh, your mother should know. But even the Beatles didn't think to base a whole song around a Lutheran hymn harmonised by J.S. Bach. That idea was Paul Simons in his knowingly titled American Tune. In this song, written in the months after an American planted the stars and stripes on the moon, Simons' patriotism is underpinned with one key ingredient, gratitude. It's something he shares with George Gershwin, Irving Berlin, Aaron Copland, Bernard Herrmann, Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim, Bert Bacharach and Bob Dylan, all the children or grandchildren of Jewish immigrants. We come on the ship they call the Mayflower. We come on the ship that sailed the moon. We come in the ages most uncertain hour. And sing an American tune. Oh, and it's all right. It's all right, it's all right. You can't be forever blessed. Still, tomorrow's gonna be another working day. And I'm trying to get some rest. That's all I'm trying to get some rest. At this stage, it looked as if American and British rock and pop music was becoming a kind of world standard. But then traffic started arriving from the other direction, with styles from non-Western cultures vastly enriching music's palette. Once again, the Beatles had started the trend with the music of India. <laughs> She's getting a little too excited here. In the mid-70s, Stevie Wonder brilliantly adapted the street rhythms of Cuba in a series of hugely influential albums. Simon then recorded in the culturally isolated apartheid era townships of South Africa. So I'm not familiar with Paul Simon. Graceland was controversial because technically it broke a United Nations embargo, but it helped bring the vibrant music of the continent to a global audience. Since then, thanks partly to immigration, thanks partly to the internet, world music has become a bustling and flourishing reality. In the mid-20th century, it seemed as if the two traditions of music, classical and non-classical, were drifting further and further apart, as if they were speaking different, untranslatable languages. But then a strange thing happened. In America, the two zones, contemporary pop and contemporary classical, gave birth to a child that was half one, half the other. The child's name was minimalism. And the arrival of minimalism provoked a sea change in the relationship between musical genres. It ushered in an age of musical convergence, our age. of minimalism in terms of music before.
Minimalism emerged quietly in the 1960s and loudly in the 1970s, spearheaded by American composers Terry Riley, Philip Glass, and most of all, Steve Reich. Steve Reich has been described as the single most influential composer of the late 20th century, bringing fresh ideas and impetus to both popular and classical music. It's a big claim, but correct. Reich derived his inspirations from African drumming and bar... I was going to say, I've heard some Philip Glass music before. I've not heard any of this guy's music before, though. Japanese gamelan music. He found that the apparently repetitive hypnotic patterns of these drum and mallet-based musics were in fact subtly changing all the time. He applied this approach to Western music. Reich is also the godfather of sampling, whereby a fragment of recorded sound is chopped up and recycled back into a musical pattern. Sampling is the bedrock of practically every hip-hop track you've ever heard. I was going to say it's big in hip-hop and rap. Sampling is even more ubiquitous in dance music than the electric guitar was in the rock music of the 1960s. Its genesis can be traced to a single work by Steve Reich in 1965, It's Gonna Rain. In It's Gonna Rain, Reich takes the recorded sermon of a Pentecostal street preacher and chops up segments of it to make rhythmic cells that are repeated again and again. I don't know if I agree with that statement that this is more prolific than the rock guitar in the 60s. Uh, I feel like the rock guitar in the 60s is way more prolific than this is. I've heard a lot of music with sampling in it before, but I just don't feel like it's as, you know, big as, like, electric guitar and rock. So I don't know. I mean, Howard Goodall knows more about music than I do, but I'm just saying from like my experience with it, um, I would say that the electric guitar is definitely like more prolific. <laughs> These techniques were then adopted in popular music, but now the exchange of ideas was a two-way street between cutting-edge popular musicians and their classical minimalist counterparts. David Bowie integrated minimalist styles from Reich and his fellow New Yorker Philip Glass into his 1977 album recorded in the shadow of the Berlin Wall, Low. Then, 15 years later, Philip Glass composed a low symphony based on material from the Bowie album. With exchanges like this between what used to be seen as polar opposites, classical and pop, becoming more commonplace, the split between the two wings of music is, after a century, finally beginning to close. More than anything, it's advances in music technology that have helped draw the two sides closer together. Music technology, whether for recording, amplification or editing, has developed at an amazingly accelerated pace right up until our own time so and on. continues to propel music in different directions, from synthesizers and drum machines to sam sam sampling, club-style mashups, and the unstoppable spread of auto-tune software, or, for that matter, playing the human voice on a keyboard. I know autotune is like really really big now especially in the last decade it's really taken off and it's like a standard way that a lot of artists now sing their songs and you can definitely tell like when they're auto-tuned it has a very specific sound to it it's kind of subtle but you kind of learn how to pick up on it and i find it annoying honestly i prefer just to listen to your natural voice but is the age of the machine beginning to get out of control is the servant becoming the master?
The cutting edge of both fields has become unapologetically mechanised and electronic in its character, which alarms all those who cherish the spontaneity and humanity of unplugged music, whether classical, folk or from other cultures. The danger of technological overload is articulated even by those who are most at ease with it. Radiohead's melancholic song Kid A, the product of a thoroughly convergent set of electronic and minimalist musical ingredients, uses a voice processor to evoke what might be the distressed cry of a human clone. Listen to Radiohead, so I don't I've never heard this before. Worrying about becoming slaves to machines is nothing new in human progress. But what the musical past tells us is that it doesn't do to worry too much about what happens next. For every movement, there's a counter movement. For every fear, a reassuring hand on the shoulder. It's a good point to make, actually. Music in our civilization started out as a free-flowing, unwritten, spontaneous oral tradition based entirely on the lives, loves and expectations of ordinary people. In truth, its fundamental purpose hasn't changed in all these centuries, despite the many layers of sophistication it has acquired along the way. J.S. Bach was probably the cleverest composer who ever lived, but he gave his performers almost no instructions as to how they might interpret his sublime music. He hastily scribbled down the notes and left them to it. It is as if he is saying, trust me and play. We, more than any previous generation, can identify with Bach's request. We press play, and a million styles, sounds, oral colours and voices breeze in towards us as if through an opened window. We're like children with a thousand games at our fingertips. We have, at last, reached a point where there are no wrong or right decisions about what music we may or may not enjoy. Just one gratifyingly simple instruction. Play. All right, there we have it. We have reached the end, and he definitely did exactly what I thought he was going to do. He went into the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century. I was gonna say, I really do enjoy like some electronic music. I, I like Daft Punk, for instance, and uh, Dead Mouse. Like some of their stuff is fun to listen to, so I can really appreciate. I like hip hop, and I like you know when they kind of integrate some electronic sounds into that. And of course, just like in the last 15 years or so, you know. Comp Oh my gosh. What are you doing? What are you doing? Chill out for a second. Like I said, she's a very energetic dog. So anyway, overall, a really, really great series. Um, I really appreciate the person who um, suggested this, and I can't remember who that was exactly. Hello. But I really appreciate it, and of course Beethoven here appreciates it as well. Again, my favorite era of classical music is going to be like the Mozart-Beethoven era. I've learned that I really like Stravinsky, and of course I love, you know, 20th century music as well since I grew up with it. So anyway, I'm gonna leave it there because Scarlett is getting really, really antsy. I need to uh, go play with her or something. Make sure you leave suggestions down in the comments for what we're gonna do next week. I've got to make that decision, and I might even put up a poll, you know, at some point this week as well to kind of kind of gauge where you know the interest might be if you enjoyed this video make sure you like share and subscribe i would really appreciate it and also feel free to follow me on social media if you are so inclined i do post some kind of behind the scenes stuff there as always the beethoven here and uh scarlet we appreciate you guys watching and we will see you next time